Welcome everyone to the Managing Madrid podcast. This is Kian Sobani. Before we get to today's Mallorca preview with Jose Perez, just wanted to bring your attention to managingmadrid.com for a couple things. One is that it's Luka Modric's birthday. So I woke up this morning and I was like, I should write something. I like to write something every day if I can, even if it's something small. And I was contemplating about Modric, but I wasn't sure. And then I realized it was Modric's birthday. So it was easy. I was like, that's fate. I'll write about him. So over on managingmajor.com, I put together three clips from the Celtic game, which I thought were underrated that Luka Modric did. And that's on the website. And also an exclusive interview with Real Madrid legend Uli Stelica. He told me stories about Santiago Bernabeu yesterday. Um, who, of course, signed Stelike as one of his last ever signings before he passed away. Uh, some politics in the 1981 European Cup final versus Liverpool. Memories from a Clásico, his connection with Vicente del Bosque and Juanito and Camacho and more. So go check that out. That's also pinned on the website in addition to all the other news. And let's get to today's podcast with Jose. Here we go and get started as always with Ray Hudson and Derek Ray. Nice article in the Managing Madrid uh, blog. Uh, wonderful lads that do a great job there. And um, worth reading about that man there. So he bet the man needs to rest and the numbers reveal why. Times ended up almost looking like a 6 3 1. Some very good writing about that on the Managing Madrid website. Such great podcast as well. Hello and welcome to the Managing Madrid Podcast. I'm your host, Kian Subani. It is Friday, which means it is time to preview Real Madrid's upcoming opponent on the weekend. And because there hasn't been crazy news today or anything we need to talk about or any Champions League group stage draws or whatever, we actually get to focus on the upcoming opponent, which is Mallorca. So first of all, I would like to welcome Jose Perez to the show. Jose, how are you? Hey, Kian. Hello, everyone. As usual, thanks for having me. And always fun to be talking about the next opponent. Well, it's Mallorca, so uh, might not be as fun, but we'll a- get to Average, it. maybe. Average. You know, it's not quite the uh, Barca, Atletico. It's not even tier B like Sevilla, Betis, but it's kind of like average. It's uh, it's like mid-table. So let's talk about Mallorca. Um, 11th place Mallorca have actually had a pretty solid defense, haven't scored many goals, but they're just kind of in the middle of the pack there. And what can you tell us about Javier Aguirre's Mallorca, Jose? Uh, this is, uh, so Javier Aguirre is not exactly someone who is known for expansive playing teams. So it is. It is a bit of suffer ball here. So this is a team that's going to play uh, something of a 5-3-2. Uh, so what they've been doing this season is that 5-3-2, although a lot of the time it's looking almost like a 5-diamond one, where the tip of the diamond is Kanging Lee. Uh, and again, it's, it's a pretty defensive setup. It will... The defensive block tends to be vary a bit of height, like against Girona, for example. Uh, that's a team that's closer to their level. They were more willing to press, but of course, against Real Madrid, they're gonna go for the deep block for sure. And then just, and then he he doesn't look that much for uh for much possession structure, but rather just to go out quickly on the counter. And they have the players for that because they have some decent wing backs. Jaume Costa, ex Villarreal, and Pablo Mafeo uh, on the on the right wing, so they can go out quickly there. Uh, they have midfielders who I would say uh, more than creative. They're just like more kind of box box to boxy type. So Dani Rodriguez and Antonio Sanchez are more that kind of midfielder. And then most important, but the most important part about what Mallorca is doing right now is the front two who who are starting the season well, which is uh Verdad Muriki, uh the uh, the Kosovan uh striker and Kanging Lee, who is also st- starting pretty well. I mean with Kanging Lee, the talent has always been there. What hasn't been there is the consistency. So it's another year of seeing will he be able to play well 
uh, week in, week out, at least his first four match days, it's starting pretty well. So right now, Mallorca has done pretty well in those four, first four games because of that, because Muriki is doing his thing, being the big man in the box, being the big man that takes in whatever melons they throw at him from the back. And because Kang and Lee is doing a great job at putting in those passes in behind. Very interesting analysis. So, like, everything you said was, um, I guess, interesting because I think it's actually it's a really good summary of Mallorca. And coming from someone, I haven't watched them as much this season. I think I've caught one of their four games, and that was the game against Girona, where I was really tuning in to watch Miguel and Rene Jesus. And mm-hmm. so what I remember about Mallorca last season is... Um, they're not like if I had a list of teams of like a ranking of La Liga teams that are like, oh, I can't watch, wait to watch this team. They're not that high up on the list. You know, they're not that fun to watch. As you said, Javier Aguirre's tactics, they are what they are. Um, sometimes Aguirre ball can be interesting. It really highly depends, um, but maybe how much talent he has or whatever. But this particular team, as you said, it's a bit more like, you know, box to box style midfielders are going to a low block against us they, again. Be fair, I think they've only conceded three goals in their four games, so their defense has held up pretty well. They have solid wing backs. Um, Jaume Costa, obviously, a seasoned veteran in La Liga. Pablo Mafeo, who has probably not lived up necessarily to the hype initially. F- yep. After that, remember that famous game where Messi's, Messi's asking about him because he's man marking Messi, and everyone thinks yep. now the thing to do is man mark Messi. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe he hasn't necessarily lived up to that, but um, he's solid. Um, Canyon Lee, yeah. Jose, the Valencia, when we were playing with against him when he was with Valencia, he always has this knack for just doing one absolutely psychotic, crazy, violent play. Like, <laughs> I wonder if that's going to come in at any point during this game if he gets frustrated against us. And Muriki, as you mentioned, I would put him as like, okay, that guy's actually kind of fun to watch. He's won the most aerials of anyone in La Liga. I think it's 24 Something like that. Uh, no one else has won more aerials than him. And it, when you watch him play, you will understand why. He is just an absolute tower. You just cross it into him and he just leaps up and he can get onto any header. So that's one thing I'd be wary about. If uh, you know, if you see like maybe Alaba running into him, uh, man marking him on a cross or a set piece or a corner, you know what I mean? So that's something I, I would I would pinpoint. And I'm curious to know what 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 else would you pinpoint in terms of key matchups, or maybe so you can elaborate as, on that one. So as far as key matchups, I think there are, uh, well, there are three things that really stand out right now. Like first of all, is what what how is Real Madrid planning to occupy Mallorca's box? Because here's the thing: like these guys defend with three center backs, they're gonna try to pack in the box as much as possible. And this time around, Real Madrid is playing without Benzema. So one of the key, so you have Real Madrid without their key player in going into the box against the team that loads up the box a lot. So like is so what Real Madrid needs to aim for here is to avoid another case of Real Madrid versus deep block where you pass the ball around without really and without really producing anything because you don't have enough people in the box. So it'll be interesting to see how they handle that occupation in the box. If Assart is the one who plays, then I like I think there's an argument for Assart playing like a bit deeper while you give the duties of Oculus, while say Rodrigo and Vinicius have maybe less creative duties and are more focused and more aggressive about attacking the box. Definitely, like this would be a nice game to to play it with, say, Rodrigo Vinicius and Valverde coming in from behind, because then you're gonna be more aggressive about occupying the box, because you're gonna, because Real Madrid is gonna need those numbers in the box. So that would be a good game to have, like those th- those three going into the box while Assad tries to do something creative, like right outside the box. So that could be a good way to break them down. Uh, that's one thing. The other area that's dangerous will be, uh, as usual, the back of Real Madrid's pressing line, the back of the midfield line. Those situ- It's trying to avoid those situations where, uh, say, uh, there's a lot of space around Tramini, and then a guy like Kang Lee can receive the ball, run into, and like 
run, say, 20 meters forward and then put like a defense bleeding pass. That's a situation that you also want to avoid. Like Kanging Lee receiving behind Real Madrid's midfield line with a lot of space. Because he he really like, uh, he might not be the most consistent, but when he's on his day, this guy is one of the most talented final passers in the league. So it's, you don't want to give him that space, like those like 10, 20 meters of space to run and put in a pass. Um, and then the other thing, yes, will be uh, the duel between uh, uh, Muriki. And in this case, it'll be surely Rudiga, Rudiga and Alaba. Um, it'll be interesting to, to see because, if, of course, if you're Muriki, then you go for Alaba. You go for the duel with Alaba instead of the duel with Rudiga because that's the more winnable duel. So it'll be interesting to see how Real Madrid handle that uh, and who ends up getting like who gets paired up with him because obviously if you're Real Madrid you want to pair up Rudiger with him yeah that'll be that's something I'm interested in seeing because this is what we'll see uh this weekend on Sunday is the back line I'm most interested to see on a consistent basis and that is Rudiger Alaba and Mendy I, I don't not sure if Carvajal will play he might get rested in the game like this mm-hmm. uh, there's reports of moderate to heavy rotations obviously there's two by default because Militao and Benzema are injured then uh, you could get Modric getting a rest. I mean, he played a lot of minutes against Celtic, and that was an energy draining match. So yeah. I think you'll see you'll, you'll see scheduled rests like that. Uh, I also want to ask you in terms of low block because you did mention something interesting about Hazard maybe dropping deeper and not you know attacking the box necessarily. Do you see that as an opportunity for if that were to be the case for Chuomeni and Kamavinga to get into the box? And do you think that is a way that might disrupt Mallorca a little bit and find, and provide targets with with uh, for Hazard? Or do you see something similar to what Chuomeni did against Celta, I think it was, where he made that uh, through ball to Vinicius when he was a little bit higher up the pitch? So how do you see that uh, playing out? So I think in this one, we're... If I'm a, if what uh, I think will happen will happen, and in the end, Kroos and Modric end up being rested ahead of, ahead of the Champions League game midweek, then like I'm assuming that there's a good chance that we're going to get Kamavinga, Tramani, Valverde as the starting midfield trio. And if that's the case, then we are going to see Tramani, I think, playing deeper and him being more in charge of the buildup from deep. He can, I think when Kroos and Modric play, then he has more room to go forward. Um, I don't think we're going to see that this time around. So I think going forward is going to be more of a duty for Camavinga and especially Valverde for the for this particular case. Yeah. One of the common questions, I mean, we all these preview podcasts we do is, um, you know, we, we often ask, okay, so against this team, is it better to have Rodrigo or Fede and stuff like that? So in this particular game, as in many games, there's a there's going to be a low block. Um, one of the questions, I think it was a Thursday or maybe it was the game after, it was a, the night of the Celtic game. I, can't remember, I think it was the Thursday mailbag. A couple people had asked, uh, in games like this, does Fede need to play right wing? Uh, or is it better to have Rodrigo because he's more of like the guy who will dribble at players, he'll take players on, try to break lines a little bit in a different way. Where are you on that? What do you think is best in a game like this? So, I mean, from an attacking perspective, I would say having, I would say almost always having Rodrigo on the right wing will be a better thing. There are, of course, situations like if you're playing, if you're playing more on the counter against a big team, like, you know, the Liverpool final goal. Uh, then in those situations, one could argue that maybe Valverde is the better fit, but generally Rodrigo is a better solution in the attack to uh, to Valverde. The main the main reason we uh, we choose Fede for right wing is the more defensive pressing intensity aspects. I think, for example, Fede was a good choice against Celtic more from a defensive and an intensity perspective because Celtic are in were a really intense team and it kind of made sense uh and it kind of made sense to have him there more pressing uh on the front line or trying to help or, or trying to help with defensive trying to help the right back say with defensive duty so from my perspective fede always makes more sense uh from defense now the other thing that's really interesting about fede and 
journalist Miguel Quintana was mentioning it this week, it always feels like he, as everyone else gets tired in the game, he doesn't. So it's almost always like the first 60 minutes of Fede are like, are like okay, but he really starts getting dominant like in the final half hour of the game where everyone else is tired, but he still has the legs. And that's really when his impact really starts showing. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, there, there's there's a second wind, I think, that comes that comes with it when you, when you see all those things happening and then you see him still sprinting around. It's the energy is amazing. Um, I guess, well, uh, I, my last question for you would be this um if you're a Gire or a Mallorca fan trying to take hope from this because if you look at every piece of evidence Real Madrid's just strength Real Madrid's just domination this season the fact that they're generating nearly three xg a game um the fact that they've basically won every single home game since god knows when Mallorca have not won at the Bernabeu I think for a few years then you have the fact that um you know, Real Madrid do concede pretty much a goal a game. So maybe it's something realistic here is like maybe they win 3-1, 2-1, 4-1, something like that. I don't know. But if you're Mallorca and you're looking at this, what is their path to providing an upset? Um, It's going to be, in the end, like from a tactical or say midfield, like from a perspective of like control, tactics, midfield areas, there's really no way for them to do it. What's it's going to boil, like if they want to like do an upset, it's really going to boil down to efficiency in the boxes. You have to be, find a way to be more efficient than Real Madrid in the boxes, which right now is insanely hard. So uh, but that's what they're going to have to fit. Like it's the the way they pull off an offset is if Real Madrid attackers have a bad day in terms of finishing and if their attackers have a good day in terms of finishing. And by the way, their keeper. So I think one of the biggest upgrades for Mallorca this season, and, and it really it's the thing that could bring them, uh, could really save them from relegation uh, is the hiring uh, of goalkeeper uh, Pedra Rajkovic from uh, from Liga. Yeah. He was he had this period like two years ago where he was really like one of the best shot stoppers in Liga. Then he had uh, uh, he had a bit of a slump, but in but in general he's quite good and he's and and you and it's been a significant upgrade for Mallorca. And I think for I mean an upset uh, from Mallorca would require a really good night for him. That's that's one of the key things. He has a, a 100% um, save percentage in La Liga so far during these four games. So um, nice. he's been he's been pretty important for sure. Yeah, and so hey, hey, like that's not out of the realm of possibility. Ex goalkeeper has absolute masterclass against Real Madrid. That's something that happens every week. I find so it's definitely so, on the cards. So yeah, it's definitely on the cards. Mallorca are interesting because they right now. They are, of course, not like a very controlly or dominant team, but they're actually starting pretty strongly in the boxes with Rajkovic defending his box, with the three center backs, and then with Muriki and, and Kangin Lee on the other side. So they're being pretty efficient. So we'll see. The, the thing is that, of course, these days to try to be more efficient than what Real Madrid is, is <laughs> it's a tough job. Like, margin of error is very small. Yes. Like, as far right now, uh, it is, I mean, we got to say like Real Madrid has had a more solid start than what I thought, imagined they would have. Like I thought this team would have a slower start and even more with Casemiro's departure. But I mean, right now they, they went into crew speed quite quickly and the team is playing very naturally, very quickly. Like something that surprised me a lot was the Celtic game because I really thought that this team was going to have like less possession and less control. And it went really well, and the players found solutions to Celtics pressing. Right, like after the first half hour, they started finding solutions. And I mentioned all this because right now, like I think the players at Real Madrid are in a pretty, pretty good state of confidence, and it really shows. And it has really shown when they played on the pitch in this beginning of the season. 
I think we're underrated, as weird as that sounds. I don't know. I, I feel like, I, which is a good place to be in. I'd rather be underrated than overrated. You know, I'd rather, like Ancelotti said it the other day when asked, someone asked him, like, you're, I think it was fifth or maybe sixth in the bookmaker odds for the Champions League. And yeah. he's, he's like, that's where we would like to be anyway. We it, it When no one talks about us, that's a good thing. So, um, yeah, I think the 538 model hasn't learned the lesson yet. Like, I think we're still rated close to IX level as as a Champions League favorites. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> you should it's have an algorithm, right? Year. I mean, they should add in their algorithm something that like hacks it with if it's Real Madrid, it should <laughs> just add too. something. Yeah. But yeah. at the same time, I think it's good for us to, um, you know, I think it suits us to not be talked about because it gives us the chip on the shoulders, you know? If we're... Yeah, okay, so I'm looking at this. Hey, Real Madrid, let's see. So what are the... Uh, for the, to make probabilities to win, it's Bayern 23. Oh, a chance of finishing. Yeah. Fifth? Yeah, we're, they still... still rel- fourth, actually, so that's... Fourth. Ah. That's better. That's better than expect. And, but that being said, it's like Bayern twenty three percent, Manchester City twenty percent, PSG fifteen percent. Then it's Real Madrid seven percent, IX five percent. We're still closer to IX than to yeah. the, to the other ones, it, which is a good place to be in. I I agree. It could change if like if uh, like let's say I I don't see it happening, but let's say if we come second in the group. And yeah. a bunch of teams play amazing and then they come first in their group. I think naturally we'll actually drop down the list, which is kind of what last year we really weren't playing well in the group stages. So there is there is some there was some truth to us not being even in the conversation. Like, you know, as hard as it is to believe before, like especially up until that PSG first like at, when that ended, it was pretty it was not a hot take to say Real Madrid have no chance of winning the Champions League. I mean, I wrote about why that's yeah. not true, but you weren't out of your mind if you were to say that at that time. But so again, things can yeah. switch and flip all the time in football. Yeah, and well, Liverpool, and of course, Liverpool has dropped quite quickly in the last yeah. two weeks for yeah. for clear yeah. reasons. And who knows? Like things, they might shoot back up depending on whether they can recover or not. But eh, it'll be interesting. Right now, like I am surprised with this start for Real Madrid because I like. This team usually has slow starts yep. to the season. So yep. it is quite nice to see them start like this. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. All right, Jose, we got to wrap it up here. So yep. thank you. Uh, listeners, we'll be back on Sunday after the game. So catch us over there. And want to thank you, Jose, again. Appreciate your time. Your scouting report is invaluable as usual. And uh, we'll, we'll chat soon. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Thanks, Kian. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And see you around. All right, before we wrap it up, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our patrons over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid, where a bunch of people get a ton of exclusive content. So go over there and join the Real Madrid family. Also wanted to give a shout out to our $10 plus patrons who not only get guaranteed responses to their questions, but also get a specific shout out on the podcast. So shout out to Brandon Alvarez, Willie Reed, Will Sousa, Way Pering, Wamik Jamal, Tyler Simon, Tyler Dixon. Tobias Arroyo Bacher, Tarek Goktas, Taleb Salhab, Tahmid Kalam, Sushank Damala, Sujai Wani, Somanchu Singh, Sherry Soriol, Sheikh Hatiri, Shamil Shabaz Sharapov, Sergio Arispe, Santos Solorsano, Samuli Justin, Samer Z, Said Mahad, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Rodrigo Balmaceda, Rishi D, Phoenix, Peter Powell, Paulo Fierro, Patrick Diafadi, Oscar Barrera, Nico Laxo, Nicholas Zapatero Zubiare, Nicholas Moller, Nick Ribeiro, MJ Diego, Mowgli, Nelson Masariego, Michael Zinberg, Marin Myrtle, Matthew Atkins, Martin Ridman, Magnus Lext, Logan Stahl, Leon Sabernakis, Kunal Tilikar, Crystal Glass, Kevin Rivera, Jose Cruz, John Fernandez, Jeff Thurston, Jason Fitz, Ian Marley, Graham Gerard, Gary Cohut, Frederick Antakiro, Frederick Sundros, Faisal Hamdan, S.A. Davisito, Eloy Enriquez, Edward Sossman, Daniel Williams, Khan P., Christian Toft, Christian Acosta, Charles Williams, Brendan Powers, Brandon Stevens, Ashik Pashar, Armand Gashi, Armando L., Antons Rudenko, Anirudh Singh, Ananya Kumar, Alex Steiberg, Al Azaz Hussein, Adrian Rios, Adarza Lukovic, Bella Chow, Varun Ramtin, Mahrur, Fabian Moreno, and Daniel Smith. Legends, love you all. Thank you. 
And until next time, Hala Marir.